Thanks everyone for, uh, for coming. Uh, this panel is on the, the public-private partnership and surveillance, myth or reality. Um, and I'm David Robinson, and I'll be moderating. Uh, we have a diverse and distinguished group of people up here on the stage, uh, and uh, I will uh, let each of them uh, introduce themselves and speak to uh, the issue at hand. But let me just let me just uh, sort of uh, give you a, a map of the territory. Uh, to to my uh, to my right, I was going to say to my far right, it's probably not politically descriptive. But uh, on the end here is uh, Josh Mendelson, who is at Engine, which is uh, a group that provides uh, policy advocacy to uh, early stage startups that are often based, uh, based out here in, in the Bay Area. Uh, 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 to, uh, beside him is uh, Jimmy Schultz, who uh, is an internet entrepreneur with uh, 20 years of experience in the, uh, in, in the tech field in Germany, and uh, is also a, uh, uh, a former German uh, parliamentarian, so has both hands-on technical and also first-hand policy experience with uh, the tech and privacy issue as it arises in Europe. Uh, I'm David Robinson. I uh, work with a small team of computer scientists in Washington providing technical advice to uh, nonprofits and, gover and governments. Um, uh, Paul Robinson and you. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, thrilled to be here today. Uh, Marie Georges is an independent expert on privacy and policy issues who uh, among other uh, roles is uh, an advisor to the, to the Council of Europe on Privacy Matters. Uh, Regan McDonald is, um, the, is, does uh, privacy uh, and other policy work for access based, based in Europe uh, and really uh, deserves the full credit for pulling together this amazing uh, group of folks. Uh, and Brad Burnham, uh, Union Square Ventures uh, in New York, uh, a uh, distinguished and experienced uh, investor of startups, but also someone who has really made a mark uh, on the policy scene. Uh, speaking as a, a Washingtonian who works, who works on tech policy issues, I, I can tell you that uh, uh, really in the, in the SOPA uh, fight that so many of us were engaged in, um, Brad really played a, a key role in bringing entrepreneurs' voices to the table uh, in that discussion, and I think it's a, a role that uh, we are all glad to have seen uh, uh, grow up to other policy issues uh, as well. Um, and with that, I will um, ask each of our panelists to uh, give a few minutes, or let me just say just one or two words myself, substantively, about what we're about to talk about, and then I'll, I'll hand it over to Josh and we can work uh, down the line. Um, so, uh, the question, as the panel is titled, is myth or reality, and I think we've learned in the last nine months since the Snowden leaks that it's both uh, both the reality of a partnership and also a reality of sometimes a non-partnership between um, the private sector and the public sector on, on surveillance. Uh, so we definitely learned about cases where uh, people are being paid by the government secretly to convey various kinds of information, as some of them may even be being overpaid, as we recently learned in the case of Sprint, which is now being sued for having overcharged the U.S. government for its surveillance um, uh, needs. Uh, but at the same time, so in the case, for example, of Google, um, we've seen both that there is uh, secret request traffic going on that the stone leaks unearthed, but there's also uh, raw hacking, if you will, of infrastructure. So not only uh, was Google answering secret requests under subject to legal <coughs> compulsion uh, in the U.S. and elsewhere, but at the same time, unbeknownst to them, uh, the links between their data centers were being tapped. And so, um, one of the things that we've learned is that not only do uh, individual citizens not understand necessarily what is going on or are not in a position to know what's going on, but even the companies themselves uh, have some more knowledge than the public has regarding their role in government surveillance, but knowledge that is, uh, in all likelihood, materially incomplete. 
Um, and I think that the policy question that I'm hoping we'll be able to get at today is as activists, citizens, people who care about privacy, what can or should we reasonably expect to do about this? What is the role of the private sector vis-a-vis -vis the public sector that we ought to hope for or aim toward? Um, and with sort of that as a framing question, I'll turn it over to Josh to start, start us off. Cool, thank you, David. Um, well, you sort of uh, alluded at the end to, to where I'm gonna go with just a handful of, of opening remarks. Um, one disclaimer or disclosure I should throw out in the beginning is I actually started my career working at the Department of Defense, and, uh, and so I, I felt for a long time like I was sort of on the other side of, of this debate, and, uh, and in, in truth, that's not really the case at all. Um, in fact, what we've found for anyone who's been in, in any sort of security, particularly cybersecurity, sort of circular universe, we just, we sort of always assumed that either the U.S. government or some other government was out there um, obtaining information that they wanted. What's been so so shocking in these disclosures has been the the sheer scope and the breadth of the information that's being sucked up and the uh, the lack of discrimination and how that information is obtained and utilized. So um, certainly, it's it's great now to see more people um, having this discussion and, and and being part of this debate. Small anecdote: I remember my my now wife. I met her and I learned that she worked at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I was like, oh, this is awesome. She's finally going to know what keeps me up at night. Um, and, and, and recognizing like these are big issues that really only, only the folks at like EFF and a handful of other places care. Um, so not the case. And, and that's really exciting to see. And it's nice to see all of you here. Um, what I will say, however, is that there's a, a natural tendency, uh, at least in, in uh, journalism writ large right now, to assume that companies were absolutely complicit in what was going on and, and had far more understanding than one would like to convey. And I, I really think that that's not the case. Um, certainly there are, there are the telecos, uh, who I put in a, a different category in a lot of ways, and certainly we know now that Sprint was making quite a bit of money off of uh, their engagement with the government. But when we're talking about tech companies, um, when we talk about the Googles and the Facebooks and and others like Dropbox who are a bit smaller, young startups. This wasn't a line of business that they were in. And I think that every executive and every developer you meet there is somebody who, if they weren't doing the job they're doing now, would be in this room and would be listening to this panel, would be engaging on this issue. And we're all really aligned ideologically. And so um, with that, really, I would say that we need to be focused on where do we go from here, what's changed, and what needs to evolve. And my argument is it's all the more reason why, as a developer of a product, as the, as the um, user of a particular <coughs> offering, it's incumbent on both of us in that equation to make sure we're doing our best to safeguard the information that we don't want to have shared. Um, and we can't really have faith in our government. We can't have, certainly shouldn't have faith in governments um, that may want to obtain our information uh, for, for any malicious purpose. Um, but. There are plenty of other actors who we know, bad actors who we know can just as easily exploit um, important information to you. I mean, I'm thinking of data breaches. We don't talk about that as much when we're talking about security and surveillance, but I think in a lot of ways the, the problems, right, the technical problems, the root problems are the same. So consequently, um, my perspective is very much one of this should be a really good wake up call for all of us that love to build products quickly, deploy them quickly, utilize them quickly. Um, all the more reason why we need to get really good at understanding how we secure that information, protect that information, and, and secure and protect our users. Thanks, Jim. Well, um, we all lost trust, I think, into the governments and to companies who are dealing with our data. Um, I started off uh, developing a software around 15 years ago we uh, called Big Brother, and it was able to do exactly what the name implies. And Germany at that time uh, was uh, talking about, uh, we were an ISP service provider too, uh, was talking about in Germany, um, the government, about uh, having a law that would force me to have a black box in my server room, in my holy server room, which will spy on me and my customers. And at that time, I understood what we have developed with Big Brother was, uh, well, not just only a tool for uh, billing and charging internet services, but it was also a weapon. And then I joined um, 
a, uh, a expert group of the German government uh, fighting it for two years against that law. It didn't succeed, so I decided to switch uh, the side of the table and became a, a parliamentarian, which took me another nine years. Um, that now, we, uh, <coughs> after the Snowden revelation, everyone, I think, understands that uh, our privacy is in, in great danger. And what do we do? How, uh, what, what can we do against it? Um, who, who of you in the, in the room is using WhatsApp? Mm. Well, it's, if you ask uh, in a school class of seventh grade, uh, almost 100% of uh, the young kids will use uh, WhatsApp. All their communication is, uh, is done by WhatsApp. I asked uh, my, my party and the, uh, and, and the parliamentarians, 93 of our parliamentarians in my party, who's using WhatsApp, and about 60 were using WhatsApp for internal communication. That's ridiculous, because we know what we are spied on. We are parliamentarians, we're talking about secret things. Um, I, and I told them, don't do it, you are going to be spied on. And they didn't believe it, it was over a year ago. Now, uh, I think everyone understands how dangerous using tools like that can be. And um, I have a lot of people you can, uh, and it's easy, quite easy to, to encrypt your data, to save your data. And it's your responsibility to do so. Because you lock your car when you leave it. Of course you lock your car. Because there are laws against uh, to, to steal a car. But of course you lock it just to be sure that it's not stolen or robbed. And the same thing, you have to lock your data and secure your data, and it's quite easy. There are tools, there are subsidiaries for WhatsApp which are encrypted, very, very good, and they are secret. And these companies can't be forced to give their data away because um, the data is so encrypted that they even can't read the, the, the data themselves. Not secured data. Um, the companies can be forced to give it to the governments. Um, for example, using Gmail, using webmail, using any mail client, which, uh, mail which is not encrypted, the provider, the mail provider can be forced to give away your data. Um, using unsecured chat software, using unsecured phone software, all these uh, brings the, the private sector, the companies, into the situation that they have to give their data away on, on laws there are for illegal interception. But if you secure your data yourself, they can't be forced to do so. Thanks. Uh, Marie? <clears throat> uh, I will be talking uh, also as a practitioner. I've been uh, th 30 years in a data protection authority in France, mm. and four years at the European level for writing the directive of 95. Um, it's difficult for users, people to say users, to understand what's going on. But I think that the more um, computerization is going in the daily life of people, and more and more, before it was only inside the enterprises, inside the, the state. Now it's more and more in our <coughs> lives. We, people can more and more understand. Uh, for years and years, uh, since uh, 81, um, in Europe we Put, we translated the American principles on data protection, which never came out as a, being a binding. We did it in Europe, and the same principles. The same for private and public sector. When you collect data, it must be fair and transparent for specific purposes, and you don't collect more data than necessary and you don't keep them more than necessary for the purpose. Plus security, that, that is the principles that you invented in America, miraculously, in the 70s. We still wait. When we heard uh, two, two years ago, uh, Obama saying that uh, he would put on the table this uh, consumer uh, privacy bill, uh, uh, bill of rights, oh, we said, Oh, okay. I won't, I won't die without having seen that in the United States. Well, today I'm afraid that we don't talk it any longer. And this is a real problem, because I can assure you, I've been making co uh, cooperation all over the world, in all countries, 
uh, South Korea, in Africa, in uh, at least five countries in Latin America. Those principles, these, these principles which are prevented from abuse, both in the public and the private sector. They are shared every day. When you talk with people, they completely agree. There are no differences. Uh, in the world, the, the area in which there, there is a huge difference between people is the, the freedom of speech, the length of it, the limits. But under these data protection principles, they are the same. But as IT are evaluating, there is a need to adapt. And what did Europe? They took the, the they took this uh, idea of the independent agency that they are in the United States. I learned recently that the first state in the world where there was this uh, kind of mechanism to make things going was in Sweden in the 17th century. It's a small country, it's amazing. And we did that because we have those data protection authorities, as people say, to adapt, to show how those principles can be um, worked with, uh, with the developing, uh, the developing uh, of data of uh, <coughs> Now, about surveillance, I have to say that for a long time I've known some points of it from the United States. The first time was when I had to deal with the question of PNR, the, the passenger name record that US was asking from uh, everybody going to the United States, huh? the reservation data. And when I saw that, I am economist basically, when I saw the data the, the American uh, administration wanted to get, there was this, the, the amount of the ticket. What is this problem? What is the link between the, the price of a flight ticket and terrorism? Tell me. Maria, I'm, I'm sorry. But Okay, I, I, I can always stop. <laughs> you know, you understood what I meant. So, well, what I think, uh, to be short, um, it's really time, and so many people are saying that to the United States. It's the interest of private sector, in individuals, and government also, to be sure that they do what they have to do and no more to get those principles adopted. And I have to tell you that because of some NGOs, American NGOs, your government came two years ago as observer at the Council of Europe, the committee of this convention I was talking about. And now everybody is asking that your <coughs> state has to come to that that uh, convention. It, it has a, a world portée. Uh, hmm. It is open to the countries. It is not at all political. It is not. It's only human rights. It's not, as I told you, uh, only uh, principles seen by European. Huh? Uh, in Europe, we protect people, no matter their nationality. With regard to a data protection. And we can, we should return to this because that's the difference between the. Ah, oh, that's terrible. You can't believe it. We, we, How can you continue with uh, IT services all over the world and say, we protect Americans and not the non Americans? Are you kidding? <laughs> you have to stop that. Okay? Now, we right. will discuss we, we about to... uh, uh, mass surveillance afterwards. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm glad that you're so passionate about this. It's, it's nice to have more passion. And I think we should be more angry about these revelations and about not having the security of having our privacy protected. Um, and I think one of the points that, that many really touches on um, from the EU perspective uh, is this difference between uh, the collection bit, um, which usually relates to the corporate sector, um, and the use. How can that data be used? 
Um, and, and this was really kind of the foundation for, for this panel and, and for this debate that's been, that's been happening, um, which really discusses and gets to the core of if we're looking at privacy, if we conceive of privacy as an international human right, a fundamental right in a lot of regions, um, and we perceive it as what it's supposed to be, which is basically control. Control over your personal information and control over your identity. Um, then it's important to take a big picture or holistic approach and to look at all of the factors that are involved um, that do lead to privacy risks. Um, and so in this sense, I think in today's day and age and after the revelations, it's become absolutely clear that whatever corporations know or whatever is online or collected in an electronic format is known and can be knowable by third parties. And that certainly includes uh, intelligent services. So, so from, from my perspective, um, as a privacy advocate, um, I see the two as very intimately related. Um, but that doesn't mean to say, as, as, as Josh brought up, it's not about necessarily attacking these companies and talking about the complicity, um, whether or not they're working uh, with them or to what extent and to what basis, legal basis this was based on. But what we know from the revelations is that whether or not they were aware, whether or not they were complicit, there was access happening. Um, so a, a lot, from a reform perspective, I think it's important to look at both the collection side. So on the one hand, you know, those that are collecting and processing data should do their best, and not do their best, should and must, close those back doors and secure the data that they have. But then, to take it one step further, they should also, we should be rethinking uh, different models and think about the collection of data. We need to be collecting so much data. Um, and I just want to throw out a few things uh, for discussion. Uh, and, the, and the first is, uh, I guess, the most blunt regulatory way to do this, um, like what's happening in the EU, is to pass you know, a binding regulation and to regulate uh, corporate collection, to collect less data, to implement things like privacy by design, or implement very hefty fines <coughs> if there are any breaches uh, in the privacy regulations. Um, but at the same time, uh, if uh, we're realistic, and I would really like to be uh, proven wrong about this, but it doesn't seem like it's in the cards for the US to uh, join basically the rest of the world and to implement uh, kind of comprehensive regulation that would regulate company collection. Um, but the tech sector is all about innovation. So if privacy is going to be um, protected, and respected. Um, if it is, as we are seeing now with the revelations, becoming uh, of consumer interest and therefore good for the bottom line, then what are some different approaches that we can <coughs> do? Um, on the one hand, the law that is going to pass in the EU will have quite hefty fines for companies uh, who are in breach of law. So economies of scale would say that companies from the US, United States operating outside the rest of the world would have to comply with other uh, data protection regimes. So would they change their policies just for the EU and the others and not for the US? Or would this be a market interest or an economy's interest to get them to, to adopt their own policies without regulation? Um, and then the other question is, are there other business models that we can be exploring? Do we have to rely on big data and the monetization of data um, for the way that we use internet services? Um, now that it's becoming, if consumers were given the option, for example, to pay for their security, maybe they would. People are buying songs on iTunes all the time. When in the beginning of the internet um, world, while well, we're still struggling with this, um, people thought that no one would pay for music because now we have the internet and everyone wants to pirate it. But we know that people do pay for music as long as it's available and they have the right services to do so. So maybe they would also pay for security. Um, and then the other question, if we are still operating in an age of big data, when data is the currency of the modern age, we should actually be conscious of the currency that we're carrying 
and the currency that we're giving away. Because at the moment, most consumers, most users of these services feel that they're using these services for free. Uh, and in fact, they're not free. We are trading it. Uh, and we are not really conscious of the fact that we're trading this. And this is what, again, comes down to the control and to the power point of privacy. It's not about not liking a company's policies, therefore you don't use it. If people are aware of what they're doing and what they're actually giving away, and they're actually informed of the risks, then they can make an exchange. And, and, and the situation would be much better from, from the user perspective. I want to bookmark that to come back to, but I want to let Brad uh, come there's in. Lot, there's lots here to come back to. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to take a slightly different tack. Um, I'm going to start by saying I don't think this discussion is really about privacy. I think it's about trust. Um, because I think that um, there is enormous value that we get uh, when we can trust some entity with uh, our data. Uh, we, we can get um, you know, uh, uh, forms filled in automatically. We can get search queries that are more relevant. We can get, I work with a company that does language learning and they watch every single click that a user uh, does, and in the process, they're able to group them into different learning styles and adapt the program for the learning style and improve the experience dramatically for the user. But boy, that is invasive. I mean, they're watching every single click, right? So, um, I, I believe in collective intelligence. I believe in the opportunity that the internet has created to to create this sort of super organism of humanity that involves collective intelligence. So. Um, I, I worry a little bit that when we focus too much on the notion of privacy, we'll drop into these protective shells, uh, you know, insulated by crypto and, and sort of isolated from the rest of the world, isolated from the opportunity to create value in this data. But that said, we have a huge problem because there is very, really no one that you can trust out there right now. We, there is no structure within which you can trust anyone. So. Um, would you rather trust a government or a company? Um, you know, one of the problems with trusting government, as Marie points out, is the U.S. doesn't uh, have a relationship with anybody other than a U.S. citizen, and for some reason thinks that they're not obliged to respect the rights of anybody other than a U.S. citizen. That's ridiculous. Google actually does. They, 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 they don't make a distinction between a U.S. citizen and any other citizen. For, for If you're a Google customer, you're a Google customer. And obviously, Google has a financial incentive to, uh, to serve those customers equally and to respect them equally. Um, and so it's kind of tricky to decide who, who to trust in that situation. It gets trickier when you realize that, um, that even if Google thinks they're respecting the data, um, they're being hacked uh, by governments uh, and, and, and not protecting the data. Um, so I, I think that, that, that you know, um, there is a problem with trusting a corporation. The, a corporation is really financially driven. Um, they're going to try and maximize their terms for their shareholders. I think I, I could argue that many internet services actually um, favor, if they think about all the stakeholders between users and uh, partners and, uh, and shareholders, they favor shareholders more than they should because a lot of these consumer-facing web services are actually created by users and all the value is contributed by users. That's one of the points that Reagan makes, that, that uh, the data is a currency that you contribute to create that value, and, and I think that most corporations don't fully respect that. Um, so I think it's a challenge to trust them, but I think it's an equally big challenge to trust a, a government. I think that the, uh, the approach that the EU is taking is a little scary to me, because I, I worry that the, the results of actually very well-intentioned regulation that's designed to protect the interests of users will have the perverse consequence of actually entrenching the existing companies that have the resources to manage that regulation, and it will it will cut off the innovation that's created all sorts of interesting new companies. So our challenge is to come up with a market structure that creates the proper incentives. Um, but by the way, it's not just a market structure because. Uh, if anybody, one of the, my favorite things on this whole topic is, uh, is a series of lectures by Evan Moglin uh, from Columbia, if anybody's seen those. Um, he makes a point which I think is really important, and that is that 
Um, this is not a transaction between me and Google. Um, I give you data, you give me mail, um, because it actually has an environmental consequence that ropes in anybody else that I email with. So I may agree for that trade. I'll give you the data, you can read my mail, but they're also reading your mail if you're mailing me, and you never agreed, agreed to that trade. So, so we can't just allow the market to solve the problem. There's a sort of an externality like pollution that we have to manage with a social, some kind of social construct. Um, so that's just a whole bunch of thoughts about you know, what, what works and what doesn't in this case. This is, this is an amazing conversation. It's a huge conversation. And I'm going to try to focus us in on a couple pieces of it with the, with the foreknowledge that it's going to be unsatisfying and that there are other pieces that we won't explore. But I, one thing that I, I heard in a lot of what people said that I really would like to come back to is this distinction between users and customers. So most Google users are not Google customers in the sense that they are not revenue sources for Google. They don't give money to Google. For the most part, they receive services in which uh, the advertising revenue covers the cost of the service. Um, this is, I mean, obviously some people, you know, you can buy storage or you can buy apps for your domain and have a more, you know, uh, privacy protective setup potentially. Uh, or you can, of course, you know, you can go to a PO box or someone else who will be in the business of, their business model is they get revenue from you and use it to provide the service that you're using. Um, which is sort of old school these days. Um, and I guess what I want to ask, especially folks here who've got the entrepreneurial perspective, is you know, in the last nine months, as we've started to learn more about how even the world's leading experts in protecting data from attack, uh, who work at places like the security teams at places like Google, um, are not actually able to protect data um, from, from various kinds of uh, attacks. Uh, and I mean, so I guess there's, there's really two parts to the question. One is sort of, you know, have we started to see people want to incentivize the companies that they work with or the companies that, that they trust uh, to have different incentives? Um, and I mean, do you think that that stands to make a difference? And maybe we can start with Josh. Yeah, uh, there are a couple of, of um, I have a couple of thoughts embedded in or the, the universe of what you've said. Let me start by saying that it is important to note when we're using an example like the NSA um, and interfacing between the data centers of Google and a number of other companies that that was one very good security team up against another very good security team. And so I want to characterize that as a different sort of, of, um, of challenge to deal with and um, where I think consumers tend to be far more vulnerable, which are data breaches and um, and, and other very targeted attacks. The, one of the, the points that I can't miss making is just the simple fact that, you know, we live in a world where your data, we, somebody, wait a minute, Brad, you, one of you mentioned data as currency, like that's actually true, and I'm failing to remember who did this study, but there were a set of leading uh, economists at, at the University of Colorado and the study was in an obscure uh, journal, economics journal. I feel so bad that I can't reference them or, or remember their names, but somebody will Google it. And so um, these guys, there it was, it was three men, and they went out and uh, did a, a series of analyses, very good methodology, and found that consumers readily give up their information when they believe they're getting a valuable service in exchange for it. And being this was an economics paper, they went so far as to actually ascribe a certain dollar value to each piece of information. Um, but what they unequivocally found was that no matter what you do, if you are providing a, a useful service of some sort, people will happily turn over their information with full knowledge that they're turning over their information and full knowledge that that information might be more vulnerable. So understanding user behavior, we then find ourselves in a, a realm of, of sort of saying, okay, well, what can we do best to secure that information? And um, Weirdly, I, I tend not to really come up with the, the, the divide between who's a customer, like are you paying the company versus are you simply a user and you're being monetized on top of that. I mean, at the end of the day, I think most of these companies will, will take everyone as a customer. So, you know, like I, I would think that a Google user, maybe you're getting Gmail for free, but frankly, like you're still very much a customer. Um, and I think, I think Google would, would say that. Um, so skipping that divide, it really becomes, well, what can we do as innovators to really help make sure 
um, we're building the right constructs to protect those users writ large. And, you know, there have been a number of, of approaches that I think of as market driven, um, where you've got companies like Spider Oak that have popped up, and Spider Oak's um, truly innovative. Um, creation is not shared storage, and there are plenty of shared storage offerings out there. It's that they do browser based front end encryption of the storage. So they never have your key, there's no way to decrypt it, they're encrypting it right off the bat. That's a great way to, to sort of have our cake and eat it too. Um, but of course it requires that there be more innovation in that realm. We need more spider oaks. We need not only the established companies to innovate to protect their users better, but we need uh, more companies to, to pop up and, and find themselves willing to tackle this problem. How do we do better user security? How do we create better encryption algorithms? How do we create lightweight implementation methods for the systems that already exist? Um, go check them out at the demo. So like you, you can get Tor demo to you right now, but I promise you the experience Tor is a pain in the ass to get going. Um, and that needs to change. Yeah, that help. Uh, yeah, I think it does. I mean, I think one of the things for people who tried spider out that's sort of lurking that's sort of unacknowledged in a lot of these conversations is that like spider oak isn't as much of a pain to use as Tor, but it's a lot more of a pain to use than Dropbox. Um, yep. And right, and there are reasons, there are actually deep architectural reasons why that's inevitable, like the fact that if the service provider, and this goes back to something Brad said about like shells of encryption that enclose each user, if the service provider doesn't have the key to your data, then it follows as an entailment of them not really having the key that they can't do server-side search of your data for you, which is a nice thing that Dropbox does for people. Um, and I think, you know, and there are actually sort of in the computer science world, innovators working on things like search over encrypted data without decrypting the data. I mean, but that stuff is, that's years away, right, from being a consumer product, um, if indeed, years later when it's developed, it ever becomes a widely used consumer product. Certainly, that's not possible within the next couple of years. It needs to be a feature, I mean, a product, I guess, right? Like, we need built it to the core, I guess is what oh, I would please, say. Please, please, uh, I would like to intervene. Um, we cannot speak banalization, we say in France, that monet mon monetarization of the personal data. This is terrible. We cannot we live in a, in a world where personal data are monetarized. Oh. Personal data are our identity. And as you said, we need trust. And how to have trust is to be sure that you won't do anything else than da, 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 which is legitimate to do. Huh? <laughs> you see what I mean? Huh? We, we, cannot, we cannot leave people saying just like this, well, money, uh, that personal data are uh, money. But, but cho, we, cho, 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 cho. we do I, And do you either we are the user mean? or customer, huh? of course we will, we will be all of us customers. I completely agree with the change in the economic model. I, I would agree, but maybe um, formulate a, a little bit different. The contract uh, we do with those large companies is not fair because we know what we get, but we don't know what we pay. We don't, I'm, um, I'm uh, on the contrary side than you are, um, I believe that almost every, no one understands which data we will give to them and what is being done with these data. No one ever read the, uh, the um, <coughs> privacy um, contract of, of Facebook. It's 60 pages long. There is not small. And, and if you ask, if you ask, uh, well, my children, 12 years, 13 years, 14 years old, of course they have never read it. And they have never read a WhatsApp uh, um, contract, which says, and that's what they do, they send your whole address book of your smartphone every time you log in. And it's not just the phone number and the name, it's the birthday, every comment you put in there. Every time you log in, they send it to a US server. And they are allowed to do everything with the data. Um, for example, Skype, which was said to be secure. They have in their contract, we are able to uh, do legal interception. How if the encryption is secure? They can't, or encryption isn't secure. 
So um, I, I'm going to disagree a little bit. I think that um, we have to figure out how to trust somebody. Um, and I, I completely agree that, uh, that users have a right to know what's being done and that we need to increase the transparency of, of you know, privacy policies. As you were saying that, Jimmy, I was thinking that uh, you know, we've gotten to a point in our lives where we don't believe we should ever have to open a manual to use any service. We should never have to open a privacy policy. We should, it should be evident based on the architecture of the service that this is what's happening and it should be completely transparent. So I completely agree with that. Uh, I think there's going to be some market pressure that will get us there. I, I heard earlier today uh, that 30% of the people in Holland stopped using WhatsApp when it was bought by Facebook. Obviously, most of the people that use Poker2 stopped using WhatsApp, um, perhaps before it was bought by Facebook. Um, so that's, um, I, I think that's a good market pressure. I think it should exist, and I, I think we shouldn't allow um, you know, somebody to misuse that data and to continue to misuse that data and to retain the trust of users. So we should find better ways to, to service that data. I wanted to come back to something um, that Josh had mentioned about the study. Um, and I think I'm, I'm familiar with it as well. Um, but it really comes down to this issue of, again, this debate on whether or not, when we're using services that are technically free, um, if we are the consumers uh, or the product. Uh, and it really comes down to two incentives. So um, if a company really makes its bottom line from the mining and harvesting of our data, with which they sell to, to advertising companies, um, regardless of what you want to call the users of that service, they, they are in effect the product, and that undermines their ability to get real change, and there's no incentives from the company to make any changes, especially if you're relying on the market, which is why would they? And, and, and that makes sense. So there is an issue, and, and this is why I, I push on the control part, because if we had more control and awareness, then this is what would shift the, the, the market. And we are already seeing it, and, and, and Brad did mention this 30% less users uh, on WhatsApp, but there's also a load of privacy protecting uh, companies, uh, like the one based in the Netherlands called Xquick, uh, that people have, have been swarming to since, since the revelations. Um, so I think there, there is movement to that. And on the terms of service issue, in particular, um, I'm not sure if it's even possible for people to understand, or for us, anyone to understand, just how much can be gleaned about you, about your family, about your life, um, with all of the pieces of data that we're basically constantly emitting. Um, there was a really interesting study conducted by Cambridge University about Facebook likes, just Facebook likes. And from an analysis of just those, they were able to determine with surprising accuracy um, a person's sexuality, their political standing, uh, whether or not their parents had been divorced, um, whether or not they use or abuse drugs, um, all sorts of very, very, very personal and kind of intimate aspects about your life, not just where you live and what your credit card number is, but who you are as, as an individual and who you associate with. And um, that was just from likes. So I think it's almost impossible to get to a point where individuals, you know, no matter how simple the term of service might be, it will be, all, it will be very difficult for them to understand the risks, uh, which makes it a, a, certainly a challenge for companies to express those risks, but this is certainly something that we should be, be moving towards. So we have, we have about 20 minutes left, so I want to... Uh, I would like to say something. Yeah. Um, um, I think more or less we agree on, on many things. Use the mic. By design and good. Sorry, good uh, you're not on the mic. Ah, is there no camera? Ah, um, you said that it was interesting to see those people who quitted the uh, 20% uh, central service. Um, would you like uh, that we do the same thing with things we buy to eat? So that they quitting. 20% people uh, stop uh, buying uh, some tomato or so because they are no good? Or do you think that we should have rules that we have tomatoes that can be uh, eaten 
with being safe. I think data protection is a value, is a fundamental value, and respect, trust, and everything, and we should not have to stop to, to go to such and such service. Those services should be, and it should be uh, an obligation for them to make good services in the line of trust. Uh, what do you do with the, it is very easy to explain what the, that are done with. It's very easy. Ex except that in the US, nobody look how to, to, to write that very easily for everybody to understand. Huh? And when you say that an enterprise is able to, to from like, and the like on Facebook, is able to, to say who you are, uh, your family, your sex, uh, so life and so forth. In my view, and I'm sure, Within some uh, more months or years, people are going to ask what kind of study can be done with all these big data? Can we make any, any kind of studies, any kind, without any protection for the individual if he doesn't want to participate to a study? You can imagine I'm the sorry. kind of study can be done. I'm sorry, but I do, I do want to make sure that we get to people who yes, ask so questions. Uh, the gentleman in the pink shirt. I have a question, or really concern with the market-based solutions to uh, surveillance online and to predicting our privacy online, is I think that while, you know, Josh mentioned uh, Spider Oak and there's other companies like Silent Circle, I think while that's a great thing that there are companies out there that are working to protect our rights online, I think the downside of that is you end up with an inversion of Freedom isn't free. In other words, I see Spider Oak is free for two gigabytes, but then they charge you 10 bucks a month. 10 bucks a month may not be many much for the people on the panel, but for many people in the world, 10 bucks a month is a lot. And so you end up with this scale where, again, the more money you have, the more protection you have. And what is the, does that ultimately weaken you know, rights if we're saying human rights can be purchased on the open market versus what I think you were talking about in, in the big is you know, the human the rights. The answer is with the price of music. At the time, people were downloading music, you know, which was not allowed. I said to everybody, if you could buy uh, a, a tape recorder, a, a thing, a, a disc, for, for two or three dollars, nobody, the people will pay. We know that people are agreed to pay. But if it is too much, no. I'm Can saying you shouldn't have to buy so, human rights. Yeah, so to follow up on that, I... I that moment, you it's, it's a great... I mean, I, I want to just make sure that everyone knows that there was recently an op-ed, either today or yesterday, in the New York Times by Julie Angwin, called His Privacy of Becoming a Luxury Good, which if you haven't read it, you absolutely should read it, um, describing the costs of the various services. She recently wrote a book, whose name is escaping me, but someone Dragnet should be Dragnet Nation. Dragnet Nation, yes, is the name of the book. And, and the, the thing of it is, I mean, so she went, goes through and buys these different things. And part of the reason Spider Oak has to charge as much as it does, I mean, they're certainly interested in having the largest, you know, user base and most business success that they can, but right now, this is a niche product where the demand for it is limited to, you know, a relative handful of people who are lining up to pay for the privacy-enhanced version of, sh of file sharing. And so, you know, the price point that optimizes for them right now is above what you know, it would be if it was something a lot of people wanted to buy. Um, so it's a little bit of a catch-22 in that in that regard. But Brad, do you want to jump yeah. in? Well, I'll just say that, um, you know, we're investors. I've been an investor for 20-some years now, and um, we really don't like to invest in those businesses, uh, the privacy businesses. The businesses that um, that where a consumer pays for um, for a service which we agree should be free. Um, and so that leaves us trying to understand how to invest in companies that uh, do this exchange of data for service, and then how to you know how to morally invest in those companies with some conviction that they actually are either architecturally um, protecting that data uh, along the lines of encrypting it from the browser going back in or. Or best case, um, you know, somehow in the governance of the company itself, giving the consumers the voice and the access that that allows you to feel comfortable that they're doing the right thing. Because if you just 
protected architecturally, you end up in this problem of not being able to take advantage of services that you could otherwise offer, like search on the server side or collective intelligence or something like that. So I'm, not, I'm not yet ready to, to give up on the idea that it's possible to trust an entity, I won't even necessarily call it a corporation, um, but an entity that provides these services and provides them for free. I, there are two questions, one one here and one in the back corner, and I want to get to, and, and thirdly in the in, in the center here, and I'd like to try and get them all. Brad, I just want to, um, uh, we'll start over here and work this way. Um, I just want to follow quickly on the, the thing about uh, investor interest in things directly with revenue to make sure that I under, understand what, what you're saying. Is that because the growth the growth and adoption curve, if you're asking people to pay, is just is so much slower. Yeah, you you put your finger on it. It's a niche, and um, and there isn't a demonstrated broad market. I'm sorry that there isn't in some ways, but um, but that's that's the reason. So let's start in the in the back corner here. Hi, Hi, Prasami. My question is this: uh, I want to know the role of uh, private security firms, McAfee, uh, Trend Micro, RSA. Have you been selling and marketing security products? So I noticed one of the panel members early on said that people don't care about their security, it's their responsibility to lock it down. People have been buying these security products for years and years and years, thinking that because they have a firewall, their data is safe. Uh, I'm curious, you know, uh, when you look at the RSA vulnerabilities that were put into the products, what would the European Parliament, for example, do for products that are not as advertised? I mean, what's a better case of false advertisement than sell a product that has no vulnerabilities? In it? Uh, what is actually the that would take or the so it's the equivalent of selling children's pajamas that go up in flames? <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> I'm marketing it as a security product. So, uh, any of the panel members want to talk about that? Um, sorry. Um, well, I, I lost trust uh, after having heard that RSA was paid. And I lost trust for the, those companies a lot. Um, the only thing you can avoid, well, you, you can um, use securely product, security product software, encryption software, is it has to be open source yeah. and it has to be reviewed. Um, use open source software, encrypt every data, don't trust no one. That's the only, that's a conclusion of, of what happened in the last couple of months. Can I, uh, so I think since we're, is it quarter of is the last, so let me try and just, uh, we have ten minutes left. Let me get let me get the questions onto onto the table from I, I know the two and if there are any others, and then I'll give everyone a chance to to, to wrap up and respond uh, collectively. Um, so uh, my name is Mike Bohenik. I'm with Amnesty International. So this question, you know, you'll you'll get from that perspective. It's um, picking up on a previous point that was made up here about the monetization of privacy, and the question is really about the dichotomy that was suggested by some of the panel between privacy and trust. And to my mind, privacy is, is of course a right. And it's a right that's even to a certain extent recognized in this country if you send a letter or if you make a telephone call, but less so if you, if you use the communication means we now all use. Trust is an emotion and that's not, maybe it's an emotion that's, that's useful to achieve a business end to maximize profit or whatever the business objective is. But in any event, it seems to me that um, they're, they're, the, the, the comments made by the various panelists suggest that a market response solely is not going to safeguard the privacy rights. So I mean, I guess my question is, surely we should be looking for something other than an emotional attachment to a company and a company's I don't know, emotional or profit-based response as a way of, of addressing, of, of, of convincing people to trust. Surely there must be something more robust. And you know, of course, I mean, the, the European approach does not seem, it, unintended consequences aside, does not seem to me, to me to be a bad idea in terms of a way of, of ensuring that there are some basic ground rules to protect those privacy rights. And then over, and I'll be amazing. Uh, so there's a huge topic I feel like we haven't addressed collectively, not uh, anything against it, which is context and sensitivity. If it becomes known to others that I prefer action movies, romantic comedies, the possibility for harm to use negatively. If it becomes known to others that I've searched for information on sexually transmitted diseases, potential harm to me and to others, my associates, becomes significant. 
So within the context of pretty much everything that's been talked about today, where does context and sensitivity come up? So a huge, huge, huge uh, factor. So uh, let me uh, sort of take, I think those questions, oh, is there one? Sorry, yeah. yeah. So the thing is, data has value at scale. It creates a you know, $40 billion company in Google, and to go even more extreme, if all medic if medical data were public, it would save a lot of lives. But like, that's medical data, and clearly that's going too far. So how do we balance that? Because I mean, you can't, it, it's, it's almost too easy to say, you know, all data is ours and should be ours alone because that's just not how the economics work. It scales up very, very powerful. <clears throat> one more. All right, so, okay, last one and then we'll wrap around. Yeah, I'd like to ask about a different sort of public-private partnership, which is the likelihood that governments are buying, just commercially buying data from data brokers and, and using that information. And I wonder if you can comment on that and whether or not that, thinking a little more as a conspiracy theorist here, might be uh, cutting down on their tendency to regulate that industry. So let me just, I'm gonna try and synthesize those questions into something that's a single sort of thing. Uh, and to the extent, if people wanna jump in on pieces of what was just <coughs> asked, uh, feel free. But I think the, one of the core things here is, as, as Brad was saying earlier, we need some social structure to control, and there's something that's analogous a little bit to some kind of environmental thing where, okay, I, I give my data to you know, this company, that company, even the people in Holland who are no longer using WhatsApp have given you know each of them hundreds of copies of their evolving address book to a U.S. firm and it's sitting on a U.S. server somewhere, perhaps not deleted and, what, and whatever else. So I think that um, one question is, given that we do live in a world where there's you know enormous value as was just said, in big data and uh, lots and lots of use of it. Um, and given that uh, it seems unlikely that we're gonna wake up tomorrow in a world where <coughs> pervasive use of big data has suddenly halted, um, I think th there's a real question about you know, what are realistic controls or realistic possibilities. And you know, one thing that gets tossed around a lot is controls on use, if there's gonna be you know, big, because a lot of the privacy conversation up till now has been about how can we limit collection, and that'll obviously continue for a lot of key areas, but I think, you know, one question is, that, that I think comes up in the context of all of these questions that were just raised, is once data has already been gathered, how do we put ourselves in a place where we can still have a conversation about public policy that imposes some, some constraint on the way that, uh, potentially sensitive data, you know, is used and that gives people, you know, some reason for some confidence or some or some trust that even after there may be companies that have a lot of data about them, nonetheless, they are still in some ways protected against some of these possible harms. Well, okay, um, it's David Sterian. The, the, you know, one of, one of the things that I'll, I'll say in the outset that's really scary um, in hearing some of the reactions and some of the thoughts is this notion that um, elected officials and policymakers are, are best able to protect users. And the policies they put in place or, or the bills they create and pass are going to be um, what will do the most to secure our, our protections. And at least my experience um, in Washington is, is anything uh, but that. And um, I, I'd certainly say, like, when you look at those scales of trust, I, I like Brad's notion of trust. I think that that's why all of us come to him for advice on things. And, and he's right, but, you know, one of the organizations that we least trust here in the United States, and I think this extends to a lot of countries, is our government. Um, so why would we want to then put a bunch of folks who don't realize that taking a naked picture of yourself and putting it on, on Instagram or was it Facebook is a bad idea, um, and ask them to create better privacy practices and what data can and shouldn't be shared and how companies should use it. I mean, that's that's immediately getting us into a world where we're gonna find chilling effects left and right and, and really quashing good innovation that could actually have the opportunity to both let us leverage data to do good, to save lives, um, to improve our lives, and at the same time, uh, you know, really find ourselves in a, a circumstance where we, we're just kind of stuck not innovating at all. Um, the other thing I'd say, it, it's interesting in this discussion, 
so I'm no expert, no constitutional scholar. There are people in this room who are, but I keep seeing a lot of the same debates that we always have between freedom of speech and hate speech coming up time and time again. And um, I know that's a bit of a polarizing example, but in, in so much of how we think about, well, what's okay to share, what's not okay to share, what should we allow, what should we not allow, um, it readily lends itself to a world where it immediately um, evokes those debates. And the example I'll use that comes front of brain is um, a, a lack of understanding what the cultural contexts are for how we think about our online data and our online personalities. So in Argentina, for example, when you're looking at legislation primarily addressing copyright or takedowns on the internet, um, it's not about somebody believing their content is on there and being monetized inappropriately. It's because uh, the society there is far more inclined to ensure that there is nothing said negative about you online. And so you'll find um, celebrities and others, and particularly politicians who don't like what their critics are saying, using copyright as an excuse to pull down um, unfavorable content. Certainly that, that's something we would normally talk about as privacy. I think in this case, though, we would, in this room, all agree that you should be allowed to say things about public officials uh, that they might not love, and it should be able to exist on the internet. And I want to make sure we're really careful here. So I, I so. want to I want to just uh, actually, since uh, uh, you brought up also sort of Brad's suggestion, I want to mix up the order and, and do a ping pong yeah. approach here. So I'll, I'll give it to uh, uh, Brad uh, next, actually, to just wrap up. But also, I should say we're we're at our we're at our time. So uh, there's. Uh, each minute is borrowed at this point. Okay, so real quickly, the uh, I want to start with the uh, democracy advocates in the, in the hostile regime and ask the question of whether or not you'd be better protected if you had a very sophisticated group of engineers working on your behalf and using a system that they managed for you, or whether you'd be better protected using a bunch of tools that you cobbled together with a bunch of inconsistencies that you had to figure out yourself. Um, the problem with using a company or a, a larger entity to do that is you have to trust that larger entity. And I think we have real, real issues in figuring out how to do that. There's one way that I'd like to think about, and it comes back to this medical data example. Um, it turns out, weirdly, that DNA data, you know, a big portion of it is identical um, in all of us. And so it's, it's on the one hand, uniquely identifiable, but at a very small level of abstraction, completely anonymous, um, because it's just a human. Um, and so there's a lot of value in the aggregation of that anonymous data. The question is, can we find a way to, to separate an individual from their data? And can we do that in the context of multiple companies each pursuing a market opportunity, but regulated to prevent the kinds of uh, environmental problems that I talked about in the future, in, you know, in, in earlier. That's what I'd like to see. Okay. Well, um, as I stated earlier, and, and we all, I think, agree, uh, we've lost trust into governments, we've lost trust into companies, and it's theirs to regain our trust. Um, but we can do something for ourselves. We, um, well, some say the internet is broken because governments uh, are spying on us. Some say the internet is broken because companies are misusing the internet. Um, I say let's reclaim the net. Um, it's, uh, it's the net of, our, 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 of us all, and we can reclaim it. And um, if you want to know, uh, maybe by coincidence, some of you are in Austin for South by Southwest Interactive Conference next week. Um, I'll be talking on Monday about how to secure yourself uh, on the internet and how to secure your mobile phone. Um, I first want to thank the person who brought up data brokers. <laughs> they are really the silent partners in this uh, surveillance landscape, um, but unfortunately we don't have much time to address them. Um, I just wanted to, to touch a bit on the cultural uh, differences and the cultural approaches. Um, being Canadian and, and based in, in Brussels, um, having supported the EU's data protection reform efforts, and you might see some of our, our papers there to give you a little bit more information about what this regulation actually is and, and what it would actually imply. Um, and having such a baseline line standard and understanding what it is, it's not that scary. But I know there is uh, a cultural difference with regards to government regulation and government telling corporations what to do. 
Um, but from the other side, think about it in terms of being uh, in a country where data protection is recognized as a fundamental right. That your data should be protected by governments, by corporations, by anyone who collects your data. And being in a situation whereby there are mostly uh, US companies or foreign companies um, that you are using at all times, that you have very little um, control over, you have very little access to remedy. And this is exactly the same thing that happened in the revelations um, with the government surveillance, is that there are, you know, 99% of the world doesn't really have a way to seek remedy. Um, so what can you do and what are the steps? And there are certainly, as Josh pointed out, um, issues with you know letting governments uh, decide on very technical and complex issues. Uh, and then you also have lobbying that comes into this mix, which becomes very complicated. But at the same time, setting a baseline standard, like this gentleman uh, from Amnesty uh, had suggested, really can set a good standard for um, what can become, what can happen, and innovation can be built on top of that. And I think that's referred to, to the contextual approach that, that this uh, gentleman brought up over here. <coughs> because the thing about the age of big data is that information can be collected about you uh, and used for different purposes. And if it is stored for indefinite periods of time, you never really know what it will be used for, even though it was collected for a completely different I know we're out of time, so I'll so, stop So, Marie, last minute, last word? Um, I have a question. Uh, what about uh, the government buying personal data? I heard that from America for the last 20 years. People asking why those data are not covered by the Privacy Act. Hmm? Okay? You agree? So, uh, please. Americans. Uh, help yourself <laughs> for the best of everyone. And you won't be able to, to uh, separate individual and their data very easily. Huh? Because, because it's our uh, identity. Huh? So it cannot be uh, sell as such on the long term. There is a right this person said, it's a fundamental right, your identity, your, your dignity and everything. You cannot leave anyone doing what they want with uh, telling you uh, prescri uh, prescriptive, de façon prescriptive. Prescriptively, he, you, you're going to have a cancer within three months. Oh, you, oh. you said that you're homosexual, of course. You did not know. Listen, are we going to have such a world? No, it's not, it's not possible. So I'm sure, with all what happened, that America is going to think a little bit and come with the others that think in another way. And it will be for the best of your uh, services, with their respect. And I am I'm okay with the word. And I think in the Convention 108 in the Council of Europe. They are uh, the International Chamber of Commerce comes. Uh, AISA come. Uh, people are very happy to come to listen to people with our other practices and, and share those. <coughs> so I hope that you will uh, look at the Council of Europe uh, website. Uh, the modernization is on its way. Completely open, uh, there had been uh, over 200 uh, contributions of people. We're, the we're going to have, to have to end there and ask you to join me in thanking our panelists.